Okay, so we will focus on some of the guidelines and regulations with regard to containment in the second module. Okay, when we refer to biological risk management, there are two aspects which we need to focus on. The first aspect is guidelines. Guidelines are not laws, they are basically suggestions and instructions for you to build upon. For instance, you have a guideline which states a certain requirement for containment. You don't have to adhere to that strictly because that's not a regulation or a legal requirement. It's just for it's, it's something which is put in place to help you. So at a later stage, these guidelines and regulations then become laws and policies. Then you have to comply with them because of the legal requirement. Because if you don't comply, there's a penalty. Okay, for instance, the Biosafety Acts and the Biosafety Laws have certain penalties associated with them, non-compliance with them. Okay, so the USDA has an Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, APHIS, guidelines. So if you refer to them, they will give you information pertaining to pathogens. Also, the localization of pathogens. For instance, some pathogens are endemic to certain areas. Some pathogens are not. So you refer to the FS guidelines for this. You also have the International Plant Protection Convention, which is a guideline which will provide you information on the pests. So sometimes there's a guideline. For instance, there'll be a corn borer outbreak. Then they, you can refer to the website and it will tell you the regions in which there is that specific outbreak. And then you ensure that you don't import crops from that place. You, you know sometimes the, your national, your country will impose laws, uh, sorry restrictions. You cannot import oranges from Florida because they have received prior information that there has been an outbreak of some pathogen in Florida. So when you import these plants, they can transfer, these pathogens can be transferred to Malaysia and then you will have them spreading all over and they will cause more disruption. So this is an economic disruption as well as a long-term ecological disruption. So that's why you need to refer to guidelines and be up to date on the new and emerging pathogens. So in plant there are what are known as biosafety levels. So these are not specific but they are more generalized. So biosafety levels are determined by studying previous situations in which you had a pathogen infecting a plant and the associated outbreak okay, and the severity of the outbreak and the measures which you undertook to contain that outbreak. So they have they are developed general guidelines of biosafety levels. Okay. So, so these guidelines are basically you have to refer to NIH guidelines. Okay, so in the NIH guidelines is NIH is actually National Institute of Health, but they have an appendix P, which refers to guidelines for the containment of plants in which you undertake recombinant DNA experiments. So they have an appendix P in addition to the regular pathogen guideline, which is in the NIH guidelines. In Malaysia, you have your Malaysian Biosafety Act 2007 or Malaysian Biosafety Laws. So it has been published in the Gazette on the 29th of August 2007. So it details specific requirements for biosafety, biorisk management, as well as the penalties which are contained in that act. Okay. So when you interpret this act, we have to look at specific experiments which we need to address when we carry out uh, ge genetic modification. Okay, so if you took a, pl a plant cell in vitro and you introduce new genetic material, for instance, your synthetic gene, then you have to refer back to the Biosafety Act and you need to carry out a risk assessment, you need to suggest mitigation measures and you need to get approval from the Genetic Modification Advisory Council in order to carry out this experiment. So you need to do this, all these steps before you basically commence your research. So you have to plan ahead. The second aspect is fusion of cells beyond the taxonomic family. So if you take for instance two plants which cannot be fertilized in, they cannot cross-pollinate in nature. 
and then you fuse these cells in using, for example, protoplast fusion. It again falls under the purview of the Biosafety Act. Okay, so once you produce the fruit, for instance, you produce a fruit using a genetically modified plant, which is designed or engineered to carry a insecticidal protein. You should ensure that your plant, right, the material, does not contain that toxin at a level which is, for example, dangerous to human health. So you need to carry out animal studies, then you need to also carry out tests to determine the concentration of that protein. So that, these are things which you need to ensure when you do genetic modification of plants. So that's, these are uh, the things which you refer to. So whenever any researcher in the university system wants to carry out genetic modification, they will fill in a form and state everything which they intend to do. They will then submit it to the in institutional biosafety committee who will then go through it and they will suggest measures to mitigate or reduce the level of risk. Usually these experiments need to be conducted in the transgenic containment facility. Then only you can proceed to basically ensuring that there is containment. So after we do all this, we still have another stage which is known as performance assessment. Performance assessment is a process whereby we assess whether all the measures which you have taken actually protect the environment. Okay, we'll go into that at later stages of this module. Okay, so these are the what are classified as genetic modified plants. So genetic transformation with vectors, for example agrobacterium, you use CRISPR, you use general recombination vectors, you, it's considered genetic transformation. Protoplast fusion, whereby you take two cells from a plant, you fuse them together after removing the cell wall. So that's also considered GM. And recombinant plant products containing DNA. For example, if you have a, a fruit and you have DNA in that fruit, okay? So when we eat fruit, we're actually consuming the DNA as well, but we are not aware of that. Okay? So it goes into our system and is degraded by our enzymes. However, when you have recombinant plant material containing DNA, we have to again refer back to the Biosafety Act and get permission for marketing that fruit in locally. Because you have, for example, you inserted a gene which is uh, from animal origin into a fruit, and then vegetarians may take offense at the fact that it has been modified with an animal protein. Okay, so that's when things come in the picture. So you have to refer to a GM, a genetically modified plant. Okay, so this is what we do. So we first assess the risk associated with a plant. Then we then apply measures to mitigate. For example, a risk assessment may be as simple as uh, this plant is going to produce pollen which will be propagated in the local environment and then you will have rice plants which uh, can be cross-pollinated with that. So you have transgenic rice and you have a field. So what you need to do is put a barrier in place. Okay? You need to have a barrier in place to protect that pollen from going into the field because if they, it goes into the field there will be consequences. After you have this barrier in place, it becomes your control. Okay, now you want to assess performance. So what? how do you assess the performance? You go into the surrounding fields every month, you collect the material, the genetic material from the plant, and you then do a molecular detection method. For instance, you can do a PCR of the gene to determine whether your transgene has escaped into the field. Okay, that's performance assessment. So once you complete all these procedures, you need to basically submit these forms to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment and they will subject it to screening and they will suggest measures to improve your level of mitigation. Okay, So when everything is clear, you got the green light, a go ahead, then you can proceed to your experiments. Remember that you need to carry out this for each and every plant and for each and every process. For example, you modify gene A and then you decide to modify gene B. You need to get approval for gene A and gene B as well. Any amendments need to be subject to new approvals. Okay. So coming down to biosafety levels, we have biosafety levels for plants. And when we have a biosafety level, it implies a certain 
procedure which we need to follow to contain that risk. So we have four biosafety levels. As you can see, if we refer to pathogens, for example, human pathogens, you will see the word BSL-1, biosafety level 1, biosafety level 2. However, when we refer to plant, we hyphenate it with a P, okay, pathogen. So if you, if you studied biosafety levels with reference to pathogens, human pathogens, there's a slight difference, which is the amendment, which you hyphenate with the letter P. So then you know it's related to plants. Okay. So BSL-1P involves transgenic plants which are not going to pose a risk to other crops. For instance, a plant which will not produce pollen, okay, a plant which cannot be propagated vegetatively, is not going to pose a risk. So it falls under category BSL-1P. Yeah, so they will not pose a risk to the environment. You bring them here, they will not propagate. For example, you bring a plant from a, a temperate climate into a tropical climate and it only require, it can only be grown in a specially designed room where you maintain the temperature and the humidity and light level as, as it was in the original environment. This plant is not a threat because when you take it out of the environment, it will basically die out. So it's BSL-1P. So BSL-2P are plants, okay, for instance, an example of this will be your pollen grain. From You have transgenic rice or you have an imported cultivar of rice, you grow it, the, the pollen spreads all over and it basically transfers its genes into local varieties of plant, local strains of rice. So in this case, you will have to ascertain whether the spread of pollen will be very large. For example, if you are growing it in an area like of in which there are only few paddy fields, few plots and then you only spread, you can contain it. You can pay the farmer's compensation, you can dispose of the crop. But however, if you are growing it in a place in which hectares and hectares of paddy fields are there, then you have a greater risk. Okay, So you have to, so BSL2P is a risk which is posed by a plant, but however, you can contain that risk. Okay. So, BSL-3 is basically pertains to plants which can carry with them, for instance, when you have imported plant, they carry with them exotic pests. So, when these exotic pests are transferred, for instance, from a temperate climate to a tropical climate, they become invasive species. This pest, in its country of origin is not a pest, it's not a very major pathogen because for instance temperature is cooler and then the, the pest cannot propagate very easily. But when you bring it to tropical climate, it's warmer and then this pest becomes an invasive species. So invasive species will then spread through the environment very rapidly. So in this case, these are treated as BSL-3. So BSL, BL4P or BSL4P is basically related to experiments involving exotic pathogens or pests. For instance, you decide to transfer a human virus into plants okay? and you don't know the consequence of this virus. Will it be propagated by the plant? Will the genome get modified in plants and will it be propagated through pollen? For instance, you transfer the whole genome of RNA virus into a plant for experiments. And then this virus actually uh, mutates in the plant and then it spreads to the pollen. We don't know the consequences, these are all unknowns. So in the case of unknowns, we treat it with, as the highest risk. Okay. So you, your, the scientists may argue by saying that, oh, this is a human virus and it's put into plant. So the host range has been limited. However, we don't know if the plant has pollen and then it propagates. So in this case, you need to have a thorough risk assessment. Okay, so we have a BL4E category.